Uh, let's open our Bibles to 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians. Is it recording? It is? Okay, good deal. That is so bizarre. I always rotate the phone, you know, have it, have it horizontal whenever I record, and then all of a sudden it says you can't record horizontal. I don't get it. Yeah, I'm telling you. So, um, y'all probably thought we'd never finish Mark, and, and I wondered myself. thought Jesus might come back before we finished. But we're on to 1 Thessalonians. So, you know, we planned on doing Genesis um, after Mark, but on Wednesday morning they're studying Genesis, so we might, you know, come back to that at a later date. And so, so I thought, well, we haven't done an epistle in a long time. Um, oh, do, okay. <laughs> so, well, we just got five chapters of 1 Thessalonians left, too, so we'll see. <laughs> But uh, 1 Thessalonians is uh, very possibly the first uh, letter that Paul wrote. So we can date it pretty exactly. It was written in either A.D. 50 or 51, all right, on Paul's second missionary journey to a, uh, a church that had been established maybe as little as a year before Paul wrote the letter. And so, um, you know, before we actually get into chapter 1, verse 1, you know, we've got to back up and we've got to introduce the book. And probably the best place to begin introducing the book is to go back and notice how the church in 1 Thessalonians, not, not the church in 1 Thessalonia, <laughs> the church in Thessalonica was established. So let's turn back to the book of Acts and let's look at Acts chapter 17. Acts 17. Now, when I was in preacher school, and we had a class on, it was on 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, and Titus. Um, in that class, the teacher, who was the director of the school, whenever he introduced the book, he went all the way back to Acts chapter 9, because he started with the conversion of Saul. We're not going to go back that far. We'll just go back to Acts chapter 17. But... Uh, you know, the, the, uh, the second half of the book of Acts uh, really focuses on the ministry of the Apostle Paul. Well, Paul is converted in Acts 9 and then, you know, grows in uh, his influence as an apostle until beginning in Acts chapter 13 and then running through Acts chapter 28, we have an account of Paul's missionary journeys as well as Paul's... Uh, and uh, his being taken to Rome to stand trial. So Paul goes on, in, as recorded in the book of Acts, three missionary journeys. So the first journey is recorded in Acts chapters 13 and 14. And then you got the council in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 15. And after that council in Jerusalem in Acts 15, Paul's second missionary journey is recorded the very end of Acts chapter 15, and it goes through the end of Acts chapter 18. And Paul's um, second missionary journey spans the years from A.D. 49 until A.D. 52. All right, so just to put that in perspective, Jesus, um, th there, there are two competing dates for when Jesus was crucified. There is uh, April 7th, A.D. 30, and then there's April 3rd, A.D. 33. Um, I tend to favor the April 7th, A.D. 30 date, though there's some really strong arguments to commend the A.D. 33 date. But, uh, but we'll say Jesus was crucified and resurrected in April of A.D. 30, and, and Paul's missionary journey, second missionary journey, will span A.D. 49 to A.D. 52. So, you know, we're talking basically um, 20 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus. So, uh, you know, as Paul starts on this missionary journey, he goes through what we now know as Turkey. But uh, the Holy Spirit puts up roadblocks from him preaching 
you know, in different parts of Turkey. He's not allowed to preach in Asia. And, and in that day, uh, it was known as Asia Minor. And so Paul gets a call while in the city of Troas, which is just there on the coast, uh, the, the uh, northwest coast of Turkey. He gets a call from the Lord, a dream of this uh, Macedonian man who says, come over into Macedonia and help us. And as Paul wakes up and as he reflects on you know, what he's seen, he sees that, yeah, the Lord is calling us to go and do mission work in Macedonia. So that's, that's exactly what they do. They cross over and they start preaching in the city of Philippi. But uh, if you remember uh, about Paul's work in Philippi, he doesn't get to stay there long because there's a lot of persecution that breaks out against him. Um, and so, you know, he ends up unjustly in prison. And, you know, here he is, a Roman citizen, which he had from birth, which certainly brought with it a lot of advantages in his missionary work. As a Roman citizen, without a trial, he's thrown in jail. And so whenever those facts become known to the rulers of Philippi, they want to get Paul and Silas out of town as quickly as possible. So they leave the city of Philippi and they travel on a road called the Ignatian Way, E-G-N-A-T-I-O-N, Way. And they travel on that for about 100 miles until they come, that is 100 miles west, until they come to a very influential city called Thessalonica. So let's start reading here in Acts chapter 17 in verse 1. So when Paul and his companions, now when you read here about Paul's companions, who are we talking about? Well, we're talking about Silas. Remember how the end of Acts 15, Paul and Barnabas were going to do missionary work together? And Barnabas wanted to take his cousin, John Mark, as their helper. And, of course, John Mark is the one who wrote the gospel account that we just studied. But Paul did not want to take John Mark along because... On the first missionary journey, John Mark uh, didn't fulfill his commitment. Uh, for whatever reason, he flaked out on them, and he left, and he went back home. He went back to Jerusalem, uh, you know, possibly went back to live with his mother, whose name was Mary, and didn't, didn't fulfill his commitment. And you know, Barnabas was an encourager, and Barnabas loved to give people a second chance, and and. John Mark was his cousin anyway, so you know Barnabas wanted to take John Mark, but, but Paul was so adamant in refusing that Barnabas and, and Paul just couldn't see eye to eye. And, and you know sometimes even good Christian people can't agree and see eye to eye. Sometimes you know you gotta you gotta work separately. You you, you can't work together. And so you know neither Paul nor nor uh, Barnabas got mad and quit the Lord's work. Rather, the Lord's work doubled because both of them went on doing the Lord's work just in separate teams. So, so Paul ended up taking with him this man by the name of Silas, who was a prophet and Silas was a leader of the church in Jerusalem. He'd gone from Jerusalem to Antioch with Paul to, uh, to attest by word of mouth that the contents of that letter uh, of uh, encouraging the church at Antioch that, that it's not the case that the apostles had bound circumcision on Gentile believers, Silas was to uh, confirm the contents of that letter by mouth. So anyway, so that he wanted to take Silas along. And then as they travel on their second missionary journey, they come to the town of Lystra, and uh, Paul had established a church in Lystra on his first missionary journey, and there's a young man there uh, by the name of Timothy, who uh, has a Jewish Christian mother, but a Greek non-Christian father, and he's well attested by the church in Lystra, and so Paul takes uh, Timothy along with him on his missionary journey. So when we read here in Acts 17, verse 1, that when Paul and his companions, the companions there are Silas and Timothy. And, you know, those are two names that are going to be very important when we read 1 Thessalonians. But when they'd passed through Amphipolis, uh, which Amphipolis, it actually means, uh, the, 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 look at the word there, Amphipolis. Amphi means on both sides, and polis means city. So it's the city on both sides. So apparently uh, 
Uh, it was on both sides of the road. That's, that's the best I can figure out as to why it's called Amphipolis, because it's on both sides of, of the Ignatian Way. So, so they pass through Amphipolis. They don't preach in Amphipolis. And they pass through Apollonia. And the text says that they came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. So again, this is about 100 miles to the west of Philippi. And the reason why seemingly they pass through Amphipolis and pass through Apollonia and they stop in Thessalonica is because there's a Jewish synagogue there. And, uh, you know, there were Jewish synagogues scattered all over the Roman Empire uh, because if you remember, uh, as we read through the Old Testament, uh, you know, the Jews became unfaithful. And when the Jews became unfaithful, the covenant curses fell upon them. And one of the covenant curses was that the Jews would be expelled from the promised land and they would be scattered across the world. Some Jews were uh, allowed through uh, Cyrus and the Medo-Persians to return back, to be repatriated and return back to their homeland, but many of them just remained in exile. And, and so, so, you know, by Paul's day, they're just scattered all over throughout the Roman Empire. And so here in Thessalonica, there's this Jewish synagogue. Now, there had not been a Jewish synagogue in Philippi because in order to have a Jewish synagogue, you had to have at least 10 Jewish males in order to constitute a Jewish synagogue. And uh, the word synagogue just means to gather together. It comes from, I mean, you just look at the word there, uh, S-Y-N, you see the word S-Y-N? That's a Greek preposition that means uh, with. And then uh, A-G-O, Sin, A-G-O. A-G-O um, just, just means I lead or I gather. So, so synagogue means gathered together. And so a synagogue was just, you know, it was just the Jewish church. It, it, was, it was a place where Jews would meet on the Sabbath day. And of course their, their day of worship wasn't Sunday. Their day of worship was, uh, was on Saturday, the Sabbath. And uh, in the synagogue, they would do a lot of what we do in church on Sunday. Um, they would read a portion of God's word. They would have a homily or a sermon based on that word. They would have prayers. They would give of their income, you know, to help the poor. Uh, they would have singing, you know, didn't eat the Lord's Supper. But, but you know, in, in many ways, it's, it's, you know, certainly not unlike what we do on Sunday. They just did it on Saturday. So, so Paul and his companions, Silas and Timothy, uh, they went into this synagogue and they met, the text says, on three Sabbath days with the um, Jews there in Thessalonica. And, and we're told what Paul did whenever he went into the synagogue. He reasoned with them from the scriptures. Now here's Paul you know, he's, he's a stranger to these people in Thessalonica. How, if Paul just comes into town, would he as a stranger be allowed in the synagogue to stand up and to reason with the people? Well, two things. You know, uh, one aspect of it is that the Apostle Paul was a rabbi. Remember how Paul was trained at the feet of Gamaliel, who was one of the most uh, you know, influential rabbis of his day. So he's a rabbi. But second, look at, the, uh, look at the openness of the synagogues to visiting rabbis. Turn back to Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13, look at verse 14. So this is Paul's first missionary journey. From Perga, they went on to Pisidian Antioch. So, you know, in the book of Acts, you've got two towns called Antioch. You've got the Antioch in Syria, which is the Antioch that was uh, the church from which Paul was sent out on his missionary journeys. Right, a very prominent church. It was in Antioch that the, Christ, that the disciples were first called Christians, Acts eleven twenty six. And then the second Antioch 
is this Antioch in you know modern day Turkey. It's Antioch of Pisidia. All right, so so they went on to Pisidian Antioch. We're told on the Sabbath they entered the synagogue and sat down after the reading from the law and the prophets. So. You know, the Old Testament, you've got the law, which is the first five books, Genesis through Deuteronomy. And then in this case, the prophets would be everything else, right? Later, there would be a threefold division of Scripture. or Well, not, not necessarily later, but another division was a threefold division. But, but here we just see this twofold. So there would be the first five books, the law, and then, and then everything else. So um, after the reading from the law and the prophets, the leaders of the synagogue... So, so these would be the people who were in charge of the service on, on the Sabbath day. The leaders of the synagogue uh, sent word to them. So this would be Paul and Barnabas saying, quote, Brothers, if you have a word of exhortation for the people, please speak. So verse 16, standing up, Paul motioned with his hand and said, Fellow Israelites, he begins to address them. So... So that was just common practice. A visiting rabbi gets to deliver a word of exhortation to the people. And so that's what Paul does. But notice Paul's word of exhortation. Go, go back to Acts 17 and notice how Luke describes Paul's sermon in the uh, Thessalonian synagogue. The text says, verse 2, that he reasoned with them from the scriptures. So, you know, Paul didn't get up and, you know, tell a few jokes and, you know, have a, a heartwarming story and then close with, you know, uh, a story of a deathbed conversion. You know, Paul rather uh, reasoned with them from scripture. Now, the, the fact that he reasoned with them from scripture means that he's, he's going deep. He is, he is showing them things from Scripture. And, and you know, obviously what he's doing is preaching the gospel to them. He's trying to show them from the Old Testament that truly Jesus is the Messiah and they need to become Christians. And in fact, that's going to be um, further explained in the next verse. Notice what he did, verse 3. The text says that he was explaining. So as he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, he was explaining and proving. Now, that, that, that word explaining is literally opening. He's opening and he's proving that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead and then quote, Luke includes some of Paul's words here, this Jesus I'm proclaiming to you is the Messiah, he said. So, you know, the Jewish view was that um, you know, God promised David that one of David's descendants would reign as king in his place forever. And the way that the Jews viewed that happening is, is they thought that this descendant of David who was going to come in the future, that he would be a military leader and you know, he would be powerful and victorious in whichever direction he pointed his sword. And so they believed that he was going to lead an army of the Jews against the Romans and throw off Roman dominion and restore to Israel its independence and, and ultimately overthrow the Roman Empire so that the Jews could be the prominent nation throughout the world. That, that's what they're expecting. And instead what happens is you've got this one who's proclaimed to be Messiah and he performs these miracles to prove that he's from God. But rather than killing the Romans, the Romans kill him. And that destroyed the faith of those who had put their faith in Jesus. They weren't expecting a Messiah who would die. But of course, you know, his, his apostles and, you know, a few of the other disciples, Jesus appeared to alive and was able to show them that, that, no, yeah, this is a part of the plan. You know, because after he was resurrected, like in Luke 24, he did this very thing. He went back and he showed them from the scriptures that, yes, Messiah had to suffer and to rise from the dead. So, so what was, what was uh, Paul's sermons like then in the synagogue here in Thessalonica. Well, here's sort of what it would be like. 
Turn back to Isaiah 53. And we're, you know, we're just gonna, we're just gonna start in verse one and, and read a few verses. So, so first of all, what he did was, you know, as he reasoned with them from the scriptures, he opened the scriptures, and so he would say, Isaiah fifty three verse one says, "Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed?" And he would say, "You see here, the text says of Messiah." That through Messiah, the arm of the Lord would be revealed through him. You know, God's mighty works would be shown through him, and yet the Jews wouldn't believe because it says, Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? And you know what? Jesus came on the scene working miracles. He raised the dead, and he gave sight to the blind, and he caused those who were paralyzed to walk, and he cast out demons. But you know what the Jews did? Rather than believing him, they demanded that he be crucified. And so you see what Isaiah prophesied was fulfilled in Jesus. And then, and then he, would, he would open the scriptures again. Verse 2. He, Messiah, grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of a dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. And sure enough, Jesus was just an ordinary man. You know, he, he didn't walk around... Uh, Glowing, you know, he, he didn't walk around floating. You know, his, his feet got dirty because he walked on the earth and he looked just like us. In fact, Judas had to identify him with a kiss to the Romans who came to arrest him because he looked like, like all of his other apostles, just an ordinary man. So here's what Isaiah said of Messiah. And that's true of Jesus. Verse 3, he was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of sufferings and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised and we held him in low esteem. You see, the scripture says that Messiah would not be someone who would just be universally heralded by the Jews. He would be one who would be despised by us. And you know what? That's exactly what happened with Jesus. And then verse 4, surely he took up our pain. He bore our sufferings, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The, chast or the punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we were healed. You see, it's prophesied that Messiah would suffer, that Messiah would be pierced for our transgressions, and Jesus truly was pierced on the cross. The nails were driven through his hands and his feet, and his side was pierced with a spear. You know, just, just in that fashion, he would just go through these Old Testament prophecies. He would open, and then he would demonstrate that what prophecy said happened to Jesus. And, and his sermon was, the summary of his sermon, verse 3 is, this Jesus I'm proclaiming to you is the Messiah. Verse 4. <clears throat> now this, this isn't what we want to read. What we'd like to read is, all of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas. But that is not what we read, is it? It says some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas. Now, can you think of a better preacher than Paul? I mean, Paul was, you know, brilliant. You know, you read his writings and you know that, that Paul is... Uh, you know, a, a genius level IQ. You know, he, Paul was a very, very brilliant man. And Paul was a very, very educated man. You know, he was growing up in Tarsus. He was educated, you know, with a, with a first class Greek education. I mean, he could quote the poets on Mars Hill in Athens, Acts chapter 17. But Paul also was instructed at the feet of Gamaliel. Paul had a first-class Jewish education. There, you know, there is no telling how much of the Old Testament Paul just had memorized. It, you know, forget about inspiration of the Spirit at this point. Just, just on his own. Paul's just brilliant. But then you add to that the fact that, that he is miraculously filled with the Holy Spirit. So he speaks by inspiration. 
Like, it, it just does not get better than the Apostle Paul. I mean, this was a very, the, or not this, these were very, very powerful sermons that Paul is preaching in the synagogue in Thessalonica. I mean, just proving from the Bible what he's saying. And you know what? Only some of the Jews were persuaded. Not all, only some. Now, now, do we know the names of any of those who were persuaded? Well, look at Acts 20. We're not sure if he was converted at this point, but he may very well have been. Look at Acts 20. So in Acts 20, we've got a, a statement. Paul's now on his third missionary journey, and uh, he's taking up a contribution for the poor saints in Jerusalem from among the Gentile churches because, you know, the big problem in the church of the first century, I mean, it was a race problem. It was, it was a division and prejudice of Jews versus Gentiles and Gentiles versus Jews. And so Paul is trying to find a way to foster unity in the church. And so the way that he does that is he persuades the Gentile Christians, because he's an apostle to the Gentiles, he persuades them to give a generous, benevolent contribution for the poor Jewish Christians in Jerusalem. And so Paul uh, doesn't just carry you know, this contribution on his own, but he gets representatives from the various Gentile churches to travel with him. And so in Acts 20, verse 4, we've got a list of those uh, Gentile, or not, not Gentile, excuse me, those representatives from the churches. In fact, some of them aren't Gentiles, but these representatives from the churches. And so notice Acts 20, verse 4. Paul was accompanied by Sopater, son of Peter in, in Acts 17, Aristarchus and Secundus from Thessalonica, Gaius from Derby. Timothy also, and Tychicus, and Trophimus from the province of Asia. So notice we got two people here who accompany Paul from Thessalonica. There is uh, Aristarchus and Secundus. And what we do know, look at Colossians 4. So, here in Colossians 4, Paul, as he often does, he concludes his letter with some uh, uh, personal greetings. And he writes Colossians 4, verse 10, My fellow prisoner Aristarchus. So that's the Aristarchus from Thessalonica, Acts 20, verse 4. My fellow prisoner Aristarchus sends you his greetings, as does Mark. Now Paul's with John Mark again, the cousin of Barnabas. You've received instructions about him. If he comes to you, welcome him. Jesus, you know, that's the same name as what our Lord wore. Jesus, who is also called Justice, also sends greetings. Now note, these are the only Jews among my co-workers for the kingdom of God, and they have proved a comfort to me. So we know that Aristarchus is a Jew. He's from Thessalonica. And so, back to Acts Act 17, verse 4, whenever we read here, if some Jews were persuaded, we might be able to read the name of Aristarchus there because he was a Jew from Thessalonica. And they join with Paul and Silas. But now let's, let's keep on reading in Acts 17, verse 4. In addition to some Jews, we're told, as did a large number of the God-fearing Greeks and quite a few prominent women. Now, <clears throat> you know that uh, there were a lot of Gentiles who were interested in Judaism, but they weren't willing to go the whole way and convert to Judaism. Think of somebody like Cornelius. Remember the centurion Cornelius in Acts chapter 10? He's a Gentile who is interested in the Jewish religion, but the term for a convert to Judaism is proselyte. And the word proselyte means to come over, to come to. Somebody who comes 
from the Gentiles to the Jews. But in order to become a pulse, but wouldn't go all the way to convert to Judaism, they would be known as a God-fearer. So, while there was only, a, there was only some Jews who were persuaded by Paul, there were a number of God-fearers who attended synagogue, and they heard these sermons that Paul preached, and there was a large number of them who were converted. And, and Paul, by the way, was an apostle to the Gentiles, right?